Spinosaurus has had quite the transformation over the history of research on this beast, developing from our concept of a relatively standard theropod with a sail chucked on top, to the extraordinary aquatically adapted short-limbed crocodile mimic we know and love today. And now there's been another incredible discovery, an almost complete tail belonging to the dinosaur that displays remarkable adaptations for aquatic propulsion. Now, I was originally planning a very different video for this week, but a lot of people have been wanting us to cover this new discovery, so I thought why not? Also, I do eventually mean to make a video looking at the entire complex and controversial history of Spinosaurus research, and this will certainly not be the last time we talk about this animal on the channel. So let's have a look at the new and improved Spinosaurus. The new tail specimen that has led to this re-evaluation of Spinosaurus's appearance was uncovered from the renowned Cretaceous-aged Chemchem beds of Morocco that have recently provided paleontologists with so much new material of this ancient creature. Found during an expedition that took place in 2018 led by Spinosaurus specialist Nizar Ibrahim, the strange-looking caudal vertebrae that make up the tail of this dinosaur were a big surprise to the paleontologists as they excavated them. The vertebrae had incredibly tall neural spines on top of them, as well as extended chevrons underneath. Essentially, Spinosaurus had even more spines than we'd realised before. What's especially significant about this finding is that the fossils all appear to have come from a single individual, as there aren't any duplicate elements that could indicate more than one Spinosaurus being represented. This is actually quite rare for the Chemchem, but it means that the reconstructed tail is reliable, not being a composite, and therefore it's pretty unambiguous that the theropod had a tail shaped like this. So what does the paper say about this discovery? Well, annoyingly, the actual paper, published in Nature, is paywalled, and a uh, certain website doesn't have it up yet, so I'm having to go off the abstract and accompanying National Geographic articles. But anyway, clearly a tail shape like this is pretty indicative of an adaptation to aquatic environments, and indeed that's what the paper suggests, that this paddle-like structure was used to propel Spinosaurus through the water, similar to living crocodilians or newts. Additionally, towards the tip of the tail, certain processes of bone that would interlock the vertebrae together become reduced, enabling the tail to move from side to side with greater flexibility. This would therefore seem to put to rest the debates over the extent of Spinosaurus' aquatic abilities, as it seems quite clear that a tail like this could only have evolved to be the way it is if it were being used to move a creature through the water, though we'll get into that in a bit. The researchers actually physically tested the effectiveness of this new tail on propelling Spinosaurus, with scientists at Harvard University creating a robotic reconstruction of the tail shape to see how well it would have worked underwater. Essentially, this reconstruction consisted of a plastic cutout of the tail shape attached to a movable rod that could simulate the strokes of the tail placed into a large tank of water. The forces and movements of the flapping tails were then precisely measured by the machine, and in addition to the Spinosaurus tail, a crocodile, newt, Allosaurus and Coelophysis tail were also tested. The findings showed that the tail of Spinosaurus could produce over eight times the forward thrust underwater than the tails of the other theropods, at twice the efficiency, and that it was much more comparable to the thrust produced by the tails of the modern aquatic vertebrates, at least at this small scale anyway. So, the paper provides some solid evidence that Spinosaurus could have swam quite effectively with the use of its tail as a paddle, adding to the already established data suggesting that this theropod fed on aquatic prey, and the aquatic adaptations noted in the skull, such as the eyes being positioned near the top of the head. But just how waterborne was Spinosaurus? This has been the topic of a great deal of debate in the last few years, with some studies presenting evidence that Spinosaurus was much more fully terrestrial in nature, while others, such as this one, suggest that it leans more towards a semi-aquatic lifestyle. One paper from 2018 attempted to determine how aquatic Spinosaurus was through the use of three-dimensional digital models, using software to see how the dinosaur fared in water. What this study found was that Spinosaurus would float on the surface and its head would have been kept above the waterline, like in other non-aquatic theropods, but it would not have been able to dive below the water. As well as this, the research claimed that Spinosaurus was very unstable in the water and would tend to roll over onto its sides, needing to continuously kick its feet to maintain balance, which is not very efficient for a semi-aquatic organism. This 2018 paper therefore concluded that Spinosaurus would not have submerged itself to hunt in the water, instead being restricted to standing or wading through shallow waters and spending most of its time on land. However, this now seems to be contradicted by the very clear aquatic adaptations displayed in the tail, which of course can only mean one thing. Spinosaurus used its tail to propel itself through the air, and its sail was actually a wing. Yeah, not really. 
There was also another research paper from 2010 that analyzed oxygen isotope compositions of spinosaur bones and compared them to the compositions of contemporaneous terrestrial theropods and semi-aquatic turtles and crocodilians, discovering that many of the members of the spinosaur family displayed signals indicative of semi-aquatic lifestyles. However, interestingly, the semi-aquatic oxygen isotope signature was not clearly identified in the Spinosaurus genus itself, perhaps hinting that this taxon still spent a good deal of time on the land, as well as in the water. Something interesting to consider about this study is that despite Spinosaurus appearing to be the least aquatic of the Spinosaurs according to the oxygen isotope composition of its bones, it actually shows the most aquatic adaptations among the Spinosaur family, that we currently know of anyway, and it could just be due to a lack of remains from other taxa. So why is this? A suggestion given in the paper that might explain the apparent favouring of aquatic habitats for non-Spinosaurus spinosaurids, despite their lack of obvious morphological adaptations to this sort of environment, could be that it was a thermoregulatory strategy, with these spinosaurs submerging themselves to cool off like modern hippos and crocodilians. But it still doesn't really explain what was going on with Spinosaurus itself. Another explanation that's given, which would probably be the reason for Spinosaurus becoming semi-aquatic, is that niche partitioning occurred, allowing the Spinosaurs to adapt to feeding on aquatic prey while the carnivores they shared their habitats with continued to take the terrestrial prey. I think this discrepancy between oxygen isotope composition and apparent morphological adaptations in Spinosaurus is therefore definitely something that will need to be investigated further in future studies, unless there's something I'm missing. Now, as I've just mentioned, niche partitioning would have been especially important for Spinosaurus considering the time and place at which it lived. As exemplified by another recent publication about the geology and paleontology of the Kemkem beds in Morocco, from which Spinosaurus is known, this would have been a region dominated by several giant theropod dinosaurs including Carcharodontosaurus and Deltadromius, as well as large carnivorous pterosaurs and crocodiliforms, causing paleontologists to designate this geological group as the most dangerous place in Earth's history. No other terrestrial ecosystem that exists today exhibits such a notable bias towards large-bodied carnivores as that of the Kemkem, and for so many huge meat-eaters to sustainably coexist in an area with relatively few known herbivores, they can't all have been preying on the same creatures. So, it makes a lot of sense that a successful predator such as Spinosaurus would seek out a different niche to the large terrestrial feeding theropods of the region, and as a result its preference and clear adaptations for feeding on aquatic prey would allow these dinosaurs to thrive amongst an ecosystem brimming with giant carnivores. There have also been some criticisms of the new paper already, with paleontologist Donald Henderson, the author of the 2018 buoyancy paper, doubting whether the tail would have been able to provide enough force to move the giant dinosaur's body through the water, as well as if Spinosaurus had the musculature to power the large tail. In addition, he suggested that the researchers should have tried to scale up their results from the experiments to the full size of Spinosaurus, which would have been interesting to see. Plus, some rough estimates by paleontologist Mark Witten have also found that the tail might not be quite as flexible as suggested in the paper, since the long neural spines appear to become displaced with a relatively small amount of flexion but when soft tissues are accounted for it might be less of an issue. Personally, and this is sort of getting into the realm of speculation and opinion more than pure fact, so be aware, it seems to me that this discovery of such an obviously aquatically adapted tail, coupled with the other aquatic favouring features that were already known, is very compelling evidence for Spinosaurus being a good swimmer and spending a lot of time in the water, where it would have hunted other aquatic animals. However, this isn't to say that the dinosaur wasn't also still a competent walker that could just as often have spent its days on the land, and I wouldn't go as far as saying that it was fully aquatic just yet, more like a true semi-aquatic creature. And I'm not saying that this is the end to the debate, there's bound to be some great new research looking into the specific mechanics of how such a tail could propel this large animal in the future. Clearly there's still much to be learned about this fascinating beast, and I'm absolutely certain this is not the last we'll be hearing of Spinosaurus. New and remarkable discoveries are being made all the time, and I'm excited to see what's next for this amazing animal. And this is definitely not the last time we'll be featuring the dinosaur on this channel. So, what do you think of the new tale of Spinosaurus? Let me know in the comments, I'm interested to hear what everyone thinks about this development. And what discovery do you think is next for this strange dinosaur? Fire breathing? I hope so. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters, especially our Dinosaur Tier supporters Darker Rot, Nicole Bueno, Dominic Bathy, and George Vojtek. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.